Hello, good afternoon and welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 6th of May and this um, non-farm payrolls webinar with me, Michael Hewson, and my colleague Colin Szynski. We'll be covering not only the US jobs numbers but also the Canadian jobs numbers on behalf of our Canadian clients because they are just as important and actually could give a significant indication as to I think not only the direction of obviously the dollar CAD but also potentially could give clues, and I'm just saying this clues, as to the direction of crude oil prices, which on some measure could well have topped out. But at the moment, we seem to be chopping about in a bit of a range. But first and foremost, before, I, my, before Colin and I get started, we have to go through the obligatory housekeeping rules, risk warnings, what have you. Uh, for the purposes of compliance, so if you could be good enough to just absorb them, bear with us uh, while we while we go through them, and then we can actually get started on the more important matters of the actual data itself. So, so non-farm payrolls, one of the biggest data releases of the month. It's not only for the US economy, but for financial markets in general. Um, but certainly, I think, probably less important now than, say, for example, the jobs report in a month's time, which will be just before the next FOMC meeting, which is on the 14th and 15th of June. Now, we've had a number of Fed policymakers come out in recent days arguing the case or articulating the case that the potential for another two or three rate rises remains on the table. Um, notwithstanding um, my scepticism about that, um, let's look at let's look at the let's look at the numbers first and foremost. Let's look at the Bloomberg's WIRP screen. W I R P. I find this is a very effective way of seeing how the market is positioned or what the current implied probabilities are that the market is assigning to a June rate rise. And at the moment, they're assigning a 10% probability that they will raise, the Fed will raise rates in June. They're actually only assigning a less than 50% chance they'll raise rates at all this year. And yet we have Fed policymakers like John Williams of the San Francisco Federal Reserve, as well as um, people like Dennis Lockhart articulating the possibility that we could get two to three rate rises this year. Well, someone's got this very, very wrong. Um, could be the markets, or it could just be the Fed basically trying to muddy the waters with respect to their future intentions on a potential rise in interest rates. Ultimately, I'm more inclined to believe the market, and ultimately, I'm more inclined or I'm less inclined to believe the Fed, um, despite all of the comment coming out of um, out of these Fed officials. So yeah, this week has been interesting because they've, um, you know, a few of them have been suggesting that they think the the markets are uh, are being a little too pessimistic on rate hikes. I think they're probably talking more about the bond market. When I look at when we look at the uh, the dollar index, and, and thank you for putting that up, Michael. Uh, I think this year, uh, what I've been running at is kind of that with a dollar index around 100 was pricing in about four hikes, 92 was price, sorry 95 was pricing in about two hikes, and 90 would be pricing in zero hikes. And not that long ago, we got down to 92, and we're kind of settling into this. 92 to 94 area, which is, is, is telling me that at least the currency, if we've got the bond market saying none, we've got the Fed saying two or three, and the currency market is telling us one, maybe two, probably more like pricing and more like one. So I think between all of them, we're kind of, we're still seeing this easing, uh, of reducing of, of Fed expectations. I think two to three is looking a little bit far out there. Certainly three is, is, getting, is, is looking way out there at this point. Well, I think if, you, if, you're, if you're articulating three interest rate rises this year, as Goldman was arguing this morning on Bloomberg, then really you're going to have to see a rise in June, a rise in September, and a rise in December. So mm -hmm. whatever, the, for whatever the merits for raising rates in June and whatever the merits for raising rates in December, in the year of a presidential election, 
they're not going to raise rates in September because it's too close to the presidential election. They are not going to want to be accused of being partisan by either the Democrats, who perceive that a potential rate rise could be harmful to their uh, re-election pro you know, re prospects, or Donald Trump, who's already articulated that he wants to replace Janet Yellen if he becomes president. So, so for me, I think two is even two rate rises is stretching it. And there's another factor at play as well, Colin, and I think Mr Lockhart actually touched upon it. He said that the Fed is looking at the UK referendum vote on the 23rd of June as a possible decision or a potential factor in the decision-making process. Well, they meet nine days before. So if they are considering it, are they going to start raising rates nine days before a potential Brexit? If the polls remain close, so that's another, you know, that's another thing to factor Absolutely. in. Absolutely, there's so many factors right now affecting that, but that's a big one. I mean, do they really want to do that at that point in time? Given the and, and which also, of course, with the close election in mm. in in, the, in sorry the close vote in the UK, if you get a close one in in the US, well then then December becomes iffy as well if you start getting into legal challenges and things like that, because you can be sure the Clintons and Trump are going to battle it right out to the end and probably pass the election date if if it's anywhere near close. Mm. So, so I mean, my base case scenario is that. If we don't go in June, which is looking increasingly unlikely, we probably won't go at all. And if it is a close, if it's not a close contest, then we probably will go in December if the data supports it. The Fed says mm -hmm. it's data dependent. Um, you know, we, we talk about the payrolls numbers. Uh, so, so, so let's have a look at the payrolls numbers and let's have a look at the data this week because I think that's important. But I think what's more important is what the price action is telling us on not only the dollar index but also cable and euro dollar. And, mm -hmm. and it is suggesting to me, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and, and if you want to ask questions, please do so using the chat facility. Um, I think there's a potential for a little bit of a dollar rebound. Now, how that basically pans out is not it's not going to be immediately apparent, but certainly I think a disappointing jobs number will obviously put pressure on the dollar. But will it be enough to push the dollar below the lows that we've seen this month? I think that's unlikely, given what we've seen here on the dollar index, but more importantly, what we're seeing here on the euro dollar. So let's look at the euro dollar. What we've got is a potential shooting star on the daily chart for euro dollar, which is this candle here with a very long upper shadow. We've also got the oscillator starting to turn over, and we haven't as yet been able to get much above 114.50 on euro dollar on any subsequent rebound after breaking back below these series of highs through here. Now, those of you who've, who've listened to my webinars before will know that I'm very big on trading levels or, you know, basically looking at levels in particular. And we can see that there was a significant amount of resistance through here. We finally broke above it. We broke above it very strongly, but we've exhausted that and come back very, very quickly. Now, that's not to say that we can't then go back higher again, but certainly on the basis of this chart and on the basis of the dollar yen, sorry, the, the, the dollar index, and there's very strong correlation between euro dollar and the dollar index, there does appear to be some evidence that potentially we could see a little bit of dollar strength, a little bit of euro weakness over the course of the next few trading sessions. It's a similar sort of story on cable as well. Probably more so if we look at the daily chart here. Again, let's blow it out a little bit. We have a very strong key reversal day earlier this week. Uh, made a brand new high and a new low, and we closed quite a bit lower. Thus far, we've struggled to really break below 144.40, but we haven't really got much above 145.40. So at the moment, we're getting pulled in a 100-point range. The bias here, again, remains probably more to the downside than the upside. But ultimately, I think it does point to a little bit of what I would call dollar strength. So let's talk, Colin, about what would cause potentially the dollar to gain today. And I think really we've got to focus on this item here, average earnings, because I think mm -hmm. a dollar, you know, a payrolls number between, say, for example, 160 and 250, or 150 and 250, it's not, going to move it. it's not really going to move it. It may move it, you know, marginally, but in terms of the overall direction of travel with respect to a stronger dollar, it's probably not going to move it that much. 
a weak number could see the dollar weaken and we could go to the top of the range around 145 and a half, 146. But ultimately, I don't think it's going to send it back to the highs that we saw at the beginning of May in cable or the highs that we saw in euro dollar. It might it might weaken the dollar initially, but I don't think it'll 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 weaken it any more than it's already been weakened in, in terms of the lows of the dollar index. So what? So, so essentially, what are we looking at here? We're looking for a, a dollar positive number. Average earnings 0.3. The annualised number is 2.4. If we come in at 2.5, or we come in slightly stronger, if the participation rate goes up and maybe the unemployment rate goes down, that could actually be mildly dollar positive. Okay. Yeah, so. and in general, uh, going forward, the earnings is also important as we look at inflation because the headline inflation numbers have been have still been relatively weak, but core inflation numbers have kind of been creeping a little bit higher over the last few months. So people will look for this to inflation numbers, and, and as we move through the month, once we get past the payrolls number, the ones we really want to be keeping an eye on for for dollar action would be the inflation numbers. So just to think about that as we uh, as we move through this this report and beyond, perhaps with five minutes to go, Michael, we'd like to uh, just have a, a, a quick chat on our forecast. This is a, a rare month that has Michael actually more uh, looking for a higher payroll figure than I am. So maybe you'd like to start? Or I guess yeah, I'll I mean, start. I was yeah. at... Um, go on, you go. Go ahead. Okay, I'll go. I'm at 175. I saw the ADP numbers came in a bit soft. Some of the other uh, numbers have come in a little bit soft over the last month or so. So it, it, it seemed to me as though heading into the spring, things have still been a little bit sluggish here. So I'm not looking for as big a miss as ADP was, about half that kind of a miss. The streets at about 200. So go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I'm looking for slightly more than that, two, 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 220,000 jobs, um, which is a mildly dollar positive number. So anything above 210, 220, I think will push the dollar higher, simply because that's the way the market's positioned. I think the market is slightly positioned short of dollars. And I think a slightly positive number should actually push the dollar higher, push cable lower, push dollar yen higher, push euro dollar lower. And the reason I've gone slightly high on non-farm payrolls is I've looked back over the course of the last few years, and whenever ADPs come in on the low side of expectations, non-farm payrolls has generally beaten it by about 40 or 50,000 to the upside. So I can display that on this graph here. So if we say, for example, look back at April last year, ADP came in at 191, non-farms came in at 251. If we go back to 2013, or 2014 rather, ADP came in at 241, non-farm payrolls came in at 330. So that sort of gives you an indication. And in 2011, it was a, it was a, it was a sim, it was a, it, it was a similar sort of story. So based on those probabilities, I think the likelihood is that, given the seasonality and given the fact that there was there's been five weeks of data jobs data since the last payrolls report that actually non-farms could actually come in slightly higher than expected. Now, that's not to say that I'm going to be right, but if they do come in lower, then that's actually doubly disappointing simply because you've got more weeks to add more jobs. And if they come in low, then actually the U.S. economy is probably adding less jobs on a weekly basis than they have been in the past. The average yes. over the course of the last six months is around 245, 250. I just want to mention also on top of the five weeks, Easter came early this year. Easter was in March, so April should have been a clear month for uh, for job creation. With a couple minutes left, I just wanted to highlight Canada employment as well. Uh, last so, month was pretty good that. with uh, 40,000, and uh, and the full time number was particularly strong. This month, I think, well, usually when we get those kind of spikes in Canada jobs, we usually get a bit of a retrenchment the following month. So I think that the the, the, the jobs creation will come back off a little bit. I think the streets being a little bit pessimistic at zero. I've, I've been I've called for uh, for 10k on the on the Canada jobs, which is a kind of an average average month. What we've also and, seen uh, in dollar CAD is a very mm -hmm. strong reversal on the dailies, and potentially we could be seeing a bullish engulfing week on the weekly. So that suggests to me dollar CAD has bottomed, which means that we could see the dollar rise against the Canadian dollar, which then potentially due to the strong correlation between that and crude oil, could actually see crude, crude oil prices come lower. So I think that's an, important, that's an important correlation to make because I certainly think in terms of Brent prices, and let's have a quick look at that. We've got 58 seconds. Quickly look at that. Look at the weekly chart on Brent. 
We are currently negative bearish engulfing. We haven't closed the week here yet, but certainly there's potential that we've seen the top on Brent and we could be about to roll over. And that could be as a result of a strengthening dollar. So again, that reinforces my narrative of a slightly stronger dollar. So if you're going to play these numbers, then really I think it's a case of buying dollar dips um, as opposed to looking to sell the rallies. I think we could see a little bit of short-term dollar strength in the short to medium term. So, unless you've got anything else to add, Colin, let's get ready to... I think um, we're ready. I think we're ready. Okay, good. So, we're looking for 202, about 200,000 on non-farms. Um, Canada Jobs is right there. Average earnings 0.3 and unemployment rate 5%. So, here we go. Numbers are due. Five percent unchanged. One sixty non farms. That's a very weak number. So that's very weak. Wow. That's very weak. 0.3. So that's, but that is very very dollar negative. So let's bring up dollar. Let's bring up dollar yen, and let's see whether or not we're going to get a dollar sell off on the back of that. There's no doubt about it. The big question is, will we see a sustained move below the previous lows? And, and I'm doubtful that we will. So let's quickly. I'm just waiting for the chart to oh, update. Canada employment was negative 2,000, by the way. Canada is doing what? Negative 2. Negative 2, okay. yep, so all that. Jump so slightly rate, below 7. stream. 1. Yeah, 7.1. Okay. And full-time, it was all full-time uh, drop of 2,000 2000 in full-time jobs, and part-time was flat for Canada. Okay, and let's look at um, let's look at the revision for March for... Uh, non farms and March was revised slightly lower from 208. So these 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 aren't good jobs numbers, but I certainly think they do take. I think they've got to take June off the table unless we get a really really strong number um, next month. I mean, what's your consensus on that? I think we pretty much. Well, I think we can pretty much conclude that they're not going to raise in June unless we get. I would suggest a 280 or a 290 in May. Yeah, I think that's fairly reasonable, and the only other way they would do it in June is if they just get to the point where they say, well, we have to do it, and to yeah. heck with the data, <laughs> which uh, it's kind of what happened back in December, but we'll, we'll see on, mm. on that one. That one's a little bit more going out on a limb, but at this point, the data certainly does not justify it when you're, because one of the, the two things that had been, had been pushing towards a June hike had been that the employment's been running strong, and it's not anymore, mm. and, uh, and inflation was picking up, which... So th this actually does present the Fed with a problem because we have mm -hmm. seen evidence of rising prices. We've seen the evidence of rising prices in the quarterly wage costs for Q1. They rose 4.1%. We saw prices paid in ISM manufacturing jump to 59, highest mm -hmm. level since September 2014. And we saw a very strong prices paid component in the non-manufacturing numbers as well. So you know, I, I made this point earlier this week in my, in my daily update. If prices start to rise at a time when jobs growth is starting to slow, what are the Fed going to do? Are they going to look through the slowdown in the jobs data and raise rates into the, into the teeth of a slowing economy? I don't think so. Yeah, the last thoughts? time we had this happen and people were asking me about in interviews this week was back in the 70s when we had stagflation and that was mm. exactly what it was was you had the uh, uh, a weak economy high inflation and and from what I recall from the work I've done the, the Fed kind of was very choppy they would raise rates for a couple of times and then they'd cut them and then they'd raise them and then they cut them. they didn't go on these long campaigns that we've seen in the last 30 years it was a very very choppy said at the time now uh, obviously things have changed in the Fed, the Fed has changed how it's operated uh, under the last few chairs, so it, but it would be really, uh, I think you'd see more uncertainty over what the Fed may end up doing and, and, and certainly uh, putting it out in the air. And actually, that's one of the things I, I've been thinking also of late is that I don't think the Fed is actually doing the economy any favors with all of their, their contradictory statements and arguing because then you don't really get a sense of what direction they actually want to go in, and even if, if they even know. And I well, think I that's think, another thing is, does the Fed yeah. even know what they want to do? I don't think the Fed do know what they want to do. I think the Fed is split. And these numbers aren't going to make that job any easier. Let's look at the S&P mm -hmm. 500, because at the end of April, people were talking about um, a golden cross on the S&P 500. And I must admit, I did pour an awful lot of cold water on that, because ultimately, a golden cross only works as a supplementary indicator 
in the course of what's happened with respect to the previous price action. Getting a bit of feedback on your line, Colin. Um, and, oh, we did get, and we did get a golden cross in December, and that failed. And, and, and again here, we are now approaching a very, very key support level on the S&P 500. It's around about mm -hmm. 2035, 2032. We can draw it through these, this series of lows through here. What we're seeing essentially is I think equity markets in general starting to run out of an awful lot of steam. And this is despite the fact that we've got the ECB saying that they're going to remain accommodative. We've got the Bank of Japan saying that they're going to remain accommodative and could potentially ease more. We've had the People's Bank of China in the last half hour saying that they're prepared to do more um, on, the, on the back of a weakening Chinese economy. But these statements and these actions are no longer having the effect that they were having two or three years ago. Ultimately, we're pushing against the limits of monetary policy. Now, does that mean I think that equity markets are going to roll over and fall quite sharply? At the moment, while we're above this key support on the S&P 500, I don't think so. But certainly, I think if we break below this series of lows through here, and this 50-day moving average starts to roll over back towards the 200-day moving average, then I think it's quite likely that we're going to continue to trade in the ranges that we've been in for the past 12 months. And that's essentially the bottom of the range is around about 1,800, the top of the range is around 2,100, and I don't think we're going to go anywhere. More importantly, I think we've seen a little bit of a weakness, not only in the S&P, even though it has managed to get back most of the losses that we saw earlier this year. That hasn't been the case for the FTSE 100 or the mm -hmm. DAX. Oh, could I just mention one thing before we move on to those? Yeah, sure. Uh, also, don't forget we're moving into May and June, which is the other uh, seasonally weak time of the year for stocks. Often we do get a retrenchment and then kind of a bounce in July, and then the and then the, the big high volatile risky period for markets is in uh, mid August to mid October. But this is the other one that kind of the minor seasonal weak period for uh, for stocks is kind of now through the end of June. So uh, we are seeing a seasonal what looks like a, a seasonal rollover under, underway as well. And that's borne out by this chart here. Now, early in the middle of April, we saw not only the German DAX break above the 200-day moving average, but we also saw the FTSE 100. We saw a number of bullish signals on a whole host of the daily charts. The fact they've not been able to sustain those breakouts is a worry for me. And the fact that now we're back below the 200-day moving average on the DAX, and now we've broken below the 50-day moving average and broken below the trend line from the February lows does suggest that that weakness that we're seeing in equity markets is pretty much across the board. Certainly we're seeing it with the DAX here. What won't help the DAX is a stronger euro. So any time the euro goes back towards 115, 116, or 117, the likelihood is we're probably going to see the DAX come under further pressure. But also to confirm that, if we look at the Eurostox 50, we get a similar sort of story. Again, we've broken below the trend line support from the lows in February. And what was more interesting, actually, with the Eurostox 50 is even though the DAX broke its 200-day moving average, the Eurostox 50 didn't. And this is something that I've looked at in the past in terms of correlation. I correlate these two indices because I tend to find that if they move together and the indices or the indexes confirm the breakouts, the breakouts tend to be more powerful. In this case, the Eurostox 50 didn't confirm the DAX breakout, which made me a little bit suspicious of it. So moving on to the UK 100, similar sort of story here, but we are pushing against support in the similar way we're pushing against support on the S&P 500. This 60, 55, 60, 60 level on the FTSE 100 is a very key support area, has supported it throughout pretty much all of March and April. So again, at a very, very decent support level on the FTSE 100 as well. Let's have a quick look at gold because I think those numbers will definitely help gold. We're back pushing against that $1,300 an ounce level. Will that be enough to push them through it, push, push gold through that um, level? I'm not convinced in the short term. I certainly think in the longer term, 
there's potential for gold to go higher. We can see where the big, big support on gold prices is. It's around about 12, 12.05. But I think also if you look at previous support and resistance levels, you can also see through here there's a decent area of support as well. And certainly I think if you look at it on the basis of this this chart here, sorry about that, I just misdrew that line. If we look at it on the basis of this nice little triangle breakout on gold, then potentially we have got room to go a little bit higher over the course of the next couple of weeks, certainly on the basis of that triangle breakout that we've got there. We take that move there, the distance between these two points and project it upwards. So that probably takes us to round about 13.20 or 13.30. Maybe not today, but certainly over the course of the next two weeks. Um, let's yes, finish. gold is definitely looking like it can move up, particularly as the as the U.S. dollar starts to weaken. We do mm. uh, so much of the the gold move this year has been driven by the uh, by the weakening U.S. dollar. One other thing I've been mentioning on gold to keep an eye out as as the year progresses is that the um, Gold often acts as an inflation hedge as well. So mm. if we uh, if we do see inflation start uh, pressures to build again, that also can uh, can help to support a rebound in gold, just as deflationary pressures in 2015 drove gold down. So, so it'll be very interesting if when we get some new sort of spending data out or we get new inflation data out, we look at prices paid data to see whether or not the inflation pressures that we're seeing building up there start to spill out into the wider economy. Certainly if you look at the UK economy, inflation was minus 0.1 in November. In March it was plus 0.5. So we have seen a pickup in inflationary pressures in the UK economy. We're starting to see it in the US economy. Is that a result of a weaker currency or is it as a result of rising input costs? It could be one and the same. It's very difficult to draw a correlation between the two, but ultimately what we're seeing here now is um, the, the dollar has come a long way, but we are now approaching a very, very key level on the U.S. dollar for the next move, higher or lower. And certainly with respect to Brent crude prices, this weak report actually hasn't done anything to weaken the dollar, sorry, to, to basically change the direction of travel with respect to oil prices. Shall we have a quick look at Canada, Colin? After that That'd report, be great, please. Uh, okay, let me see if I can find it. There it is. So, despite the fact that we've, it's been a horrible U.S. report, the CAD has broken. The dollar has broken, broken higher, higher against the Canadian dollar. So, yeah, which is showing the Canadian because the Canadian report was soft as well. So mm -hmm. we're. Uh, I think we're we're seeing that uh, that play out oil coming off and uh, one and off one off yeah one off sets the other <laughs> yeah and yeah. that's and that's the great thing about foreign exchange isn't it you get two lousy reports but which one's the lousier <laughs> exactly <laughs> but it's it's interesting the one that really intrigued me this week was the trade reports where you had the U S a lot better Canada a lot worse and that was what triggered that huge uh, bullish engulfing day and, and mm. it's interesting because usually it's usually employment that has those kind of swings rather than trade but that's where it was that big day was it was a a divergence in trade. So and now we're seeing follow through on the on the job numbers. And this is why it's so important that when you look at the data, you look at the price action first, because the price action is probably more important than the data. You've mm -hmm. got a very soft US jobs report, but the dollar hasn't really sunk significantly. Yeah, we had an initial knee jerk sell off, but it's starting to come back. You know, and I think I think that is that 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 is so important in terms of the overall dynamics when you're when you're trying to trade a market. How often have we said that is a lousy number, the dollar's gone up, or that's a really good number and the dollar's gone down? It makes no intrinsic sense in terms of how you perceive the data, but it's not whether or not the data is bad or whether or not the data is good. It's about what's already priced in. And maybe expectations were fairly low that this would probably be a poor report. And, as, and I think to a certain extent, I think people were expecting a slightly disappointing report. This was slightly more disappointing than I think people had expected it to be. But nonetheless, I think if we look at 
currency positioning, and I think that's important as well. If we look at the client sentiment on, say, for example, dollar yen, um, positioning-wise, the market's predominantly long, which is probably why we saw the the, the, the sell-off that we saw initially, but the big question is, can this sell-off be sustained in the face of the fact that we are probably at the lows of the week? Are you going to want to go home, short dollar yen, at a time when the Bank of Japan is talking about potential intervention? That's something else that you've got to price in to your overall equation when you're looking at dollar yen, bearing in mind that Japan has been off for an awful lot of this week in Golden Week and therefore the Bank of Japan might want to lay down a marker when it returns next week. So, you know, we're seeing dollar yen under pressure at the moment. The big question is how many people in the market are going to want to go home short? And ultimately, if it was me, I'd want to square up into the weekend. So let's go back and look at euro dollar and see how that's getting on. And um, what happened here? Let's have a quick look at the one-hour chart. So there we have it. Sharp move higher to 114.75, 114.80. Lousy jobs report has come all the way back. Completely counterintuitive. So the dollar's weakened, and it's come straight back, which suggests to me that ultimately, despite the fact there's a lousy report, the line, the line of least resistance at the moment for euro dollar is probably for a test of the downside. Yeah, this is also telling us that we're definitely into a trading correction for the um, for the the currencies with the U.S. dollar bouncing back up after a big sell-off. These things coming back off after a big rally. And, and you and I did mention just before the numbers came out that a 150 to 250 report mm. would would probably not have a, a massive uh, imp impact on the Fed speculation, and that we'd probably go back to more of the the technical trading, which is what we've seen so uh, so far. And that's exactly right. And you can see a lot of the market is short euro dollar. So we got we got a nice little squeeze of those shorts, but now we're coming back. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it's probably going to be the same thing going forward. So this is why technical analysis and charts is so important in terms of where the support and resistance levels are. There's also the fact with respect to euro sterling, that can actually give you some clues as to what the, the currencies may do. Because let's look at this euro sterling chart. Does this look that's like... Okay. A, a potential head and shoulders reversal. At the Absolutely, moment, I agree. We've got a decent area of resistance between 79.30 and 79.40. Why is that level important? Well, I'll tell you why that level is important. Let's look at the 200 week moving average. We traded above it, we traded through it. We haven't been able to hold above it, but look what we've got here. We've had a bearish engulfing week in mid April. We've traded lower, we've come all the way back down. We're now pushing back against the 200 week moving average, which would appear to suggest there's significant pressure there. If we now take that down into the daily charts, we can see where the resistance level is. We can see where it was resistance there, it was resistance there. It then acted as support on these four days here, and it is now acting as resistance. So this is where resistance and support reverse their roles quite nicely and enable you as the trader to set your stop loss levels accordingly. So Euro Sterling suggests to me that there's further downside while well, we stay below 79.50 and if we do break below this level here then we're looking at further losses which suggests to me that we are going to be vulnerable to Euro weakness and Sterling strength. The biggest problem we've got is how does that play out in Euro dollar and Sterling dollar and this is where technical analysis again comes in. You've got a bearish engulfing pattern on cable here, which suggests that cable is probably vulnerable to a downside correction, but probably less so than euro dollar. Euro dollar's got to go down faster than sterling dollar for euro sterling to go down, if that makes sense. If it doesn't, drop me, drop me a line on Twitter at M Houston CMC and I'll try to answer it in a slightly more um, simplistic way. But in essence, all of these charts are pointing to a little bit of sterling weakness against the dollar, but of euro weakness against sterling, which in that case would equate to potentially a little bit of euro weakness against the dollar as well. 
There was something else that I meant to mention, and, I, and, and, and it's escaped to me, but I certainly don't think we're, we're going to see significant currency moves today um, as we head into the weekend. But ultimately, I think going back to the, the dollars, the, do, the dollar story, I don't think we're going to see um, new lows in the dollar today. Does anyone have any questions on anything that we haven't covered quite yet? Or I haven't covered Aussie dollar, actually. That's probably worth looking at. Uh, that's probably the other one you were thinking of. That was the other one I was thinking of because let's look at this break. Let's look at this breakout on Aussie dollar. It's starting to roll over pretty badly. That is rolling, as you say, and I think we're going to come back and test this 200-day moving average, which is around about 72 and a half. So it's about 100 points lower than where we are already. Um, significant breakout, topped out. Let's look at the weekly chart. Again, that's pretty. That's a pretty powerful indicator. The oscillator is starting to turn over. Downward momentum is probably starting to build up there. And again, what we've got here is a little bit of divergence on monetary policy, or convergence, I should say, because the Australian Australian rates have just been cut by 25 basis points. People are speculating that the RBA could cut again in June. If that is the case. The interest rate differentials between the RBA and the Fed will continue to narrow, and that will favour the US dollar over the Aussie dollar. Okay, it's 10-2. Um, does anyone have any questions that they would like to direct towards Colin or myself? If not, uh, I think we'd both like to thank you all for joining us today. We'll pop this up on YouTube later if you, any of you want to go back and revisit any of the points that Colin and I have discussed. Otherwise, we'd like to thank you all for um, your attendance today and hopefully, hope, hopefully you got everything that you wanted from today's webinar. Thanks, Phil. Thank you all for joining us today and um, have a great day trading. Cheers, Colin. Cheers, Michael.